Hello, good evening and welcome back. So, as the global cases pass 1 million, as we are saying that it is still continuing, it does seem that the growth is slowly slowing at least, um, and we are at least making our way towards herd immunity, and we see a load of reports, but so many people are distanced from this virus, this pandemic in and of their own lives, as in not really knowing anybody who's had it, and the only uh, reports that you know of people who have gone through it say that, yes, it, it sucks, you're um, out of it for a few days, um, but that's about it. It's, it's like a bad flu, um, obviously being slightly different from a proper flu virus of the H1N1 variety from uh, pigs and birds, of course, um, like the Spanish flu was called the Spanish flu because they're the only ones that were talking about it, of course, not because of its originations, which are or origins, which are supposed to be from China and then uh, became more widespread in Kansas in, in America and then spread through and was particularly devastating uh, in World War One because the people with mild symptoms were kept on the front lines where they still had malnourishment and very poor hygiene, in which case they were ill anyway and would be more likely to die from it. And of course, the more severe cases would be sent home, at which point they could be spread through wider society instead of the more deadly one that, that came a couple of decades later, in which case the opposite happened, that the people who were worst affected uh, kept themselves at home. But uh, and that, that was about 25 times more um, deadly than regular flu. Whereas this coronavirus, which is a more deadly version of the common cold, which is also a coronavirus, um, again, a similar mortality rate, uh, apparently, depending on whose figures you take, of course, is much more infectious, and th that is particularly where the, the problem comes from and why quarantining is recommended so much, that it's, it's about two to three times as contagious as the common cold, for example, um, and you, you know from personal experience how contagious that is, of course. So, yes, now the global cases pass 1 million. The fatality rates we don't know because people track it very differently. Uh, for a start, we don't know how many people actually have it. Uh, some would say that, yes, it passed a million a, a long time ago just because we haven't been doing the testings. And so you, you can't know the mortality rates. And then, of course, that would suggest that the mortality rate is, is lower than we're seeing it as at the moment. And then also people who die with coronavirus, it is then put down to dying from coronavirus and attributed to coronavirus. So even if they have a few months left to live, that's why you see some estimates saying it's about, uh, the mortality rate is about 14% for the over 80s uh, because of underlying health conditions, uh, essentially. Um, and you, you don't know what else is at play. If they have any other lung diseases, of course, in, in particular, then that's the... Um, the main issue seeing is that the lungs are of course affected by the virus and any other underlying health conditions, but then also the body's immune system then attacks the lungs as well because it goes into overdrive in order to help stop that. Um, and it affects the heart in a similar way. So even people with underlying uh, heart disease or uh, poor heart health, they are of course at higher risk here as well. So yes, the global case is past 1 million, including that it has now gone into Dugavi in Mumbai in India, uh, which is the uh, most densely populated slum in all of Asia, uh, depending on whose estimates you use, but it is widely considered to be uh, the most densely populated. And given that their medical knowledge and progression isn't nearly as sophisticated as in the developed world, then of course it is going to be more deadly there, unless the conspiracy theory saying that it is trying to affect Caucasians more so than anybody else are true, in which case it won't be as deadly there, or might be just, just about as deadly there as it is for the developed countries in the West. Um, given, as I say, that the lack of sanitary conditions and understanding of hygiene and why they drink cow urine and, and all that lovely, lovely, all cultures are beautiful, uh, way of life that they have over there. But as we are taking this very seriously, we can see, of course, that there's a man jailed for six months for coughing on a police officer, for being drunk and rowdy at the time, and of course they report on the white guy uh, being bad here, and when the white guy saves today, especially when that white guy is Tommy Robinson and Hitchin, because he's stopping three illegal immigrant youths, <laughs> one of whom was on bail 
for knife crime as well as carrying a gun and the other two were drug dealers but yes um, you, you can say this is all conjecture if you wish and that's fine uh, nonetheless I'm predominantly going for the colour or ethnic background of the perpetrators not because it matters to me but because it matters to the, the BBC and the, the, the mainstream media who wish to report this so that their funding won't be cut and they won't be called out by the vocal minority for being racist so the 55 year old Adam Lewis uh, said that he I, I am COVID and I'm going to cough in your face and you'll get it after flagging down a cyclist in Westminster who was um, in that area because of a man trying to break into cars essentially and then he also threatened to bite the police officer and was eventually given a six month jail sentence <clears throat> so that's how seriously it is being taken of course you, you can get other infections from p people if they are projecting their, their phlegm and their spittle uh, in, into your orifices a mouth nose eyes so basically just just face that's the vulnerable part then yes there are of course other illnesses that you can contract so in terms of taking away people's freedoms uh, there we have and how seriously it is being taken by the law professionals well back to the government response so matt hancock sets aim of 100,000 tests a day by the end of april and they're about 10,000 at the moment so that's got some serious ramping up to do um have they got the infrastructure in order to do it no they haven't are they calling upon the private companies who are all <laughs> have already helped them get to 10,000 and uh, are doing more in order to, to make things quicker and more efficient yes of course they are are they going to admit that the private companies are doing it better no of course not although <laughs> his five point plan because they love the number five it says you want swab tests to check if people already have the virus in labs gone by Public Health England. Cool. So they're, they're very quick to use as well. Using commercial partners such as universities and private businesses like Amazon and Boots to do more swab testing. So uh, appealing to the private market. Well done. Good. Good. You're, you're understanding where innovation is. Introducing antibody blood tests to check whether people have had the virus. There must be an antigen. Uh, if you have it in antibodies, your body responds to say if you have had it. The point being that if you're cleared that you have had it and you're now immune, you can get back to work, essentially. You, you can get back to life as normal, um, un unless they wish to then still protect some other people, in which point they haven't said at what point we'll be allowed to come back to work, but they're simply saying we'll review it again and again and again. I would quite like to see them say, okay, so if we get to a point at which... And you, you could put this down to particular demographics as well, if you want. So you could say, if 40% of the workforce have had it, then we can get, get back to normal. Or 60% of the workforce, or if it even has to be 80% of the entire population has, it, has had it, then we can get back to life as normal. Uh, which is then pushing herd immunity anyway, at which point the Remainers um, won't won't be con concerned about getting it when, when you get into those really high numbers at that point it is basically gone anyway because it it can't be transmitted around enough anyway uh anywhere anymore in which case it is no longer as infectious or contagious because there's nowhere for it to spread um, and then surveillance to determine the rate of infection and how it is spreading across the country yep of course uh, we we can't fight anything unless we take away more of your freedoms of course uh, you've got to change your freedom for safety don't you know and don't you be listening to that Benjamin Franklin gentleman who said that you're going to be losing both. And building a British diagnostics industry with help from pharmaceutical giants. So, uh, again, back to the, the private market. Although, well, yeah, I, I suppose well, when it comes down to pharmaceutical giants and big pharma and for any companies, including Amazon, of, of course, yes, who put in so many lobbying efforts that basically what lobbying comes down to is you either bribe the politicians or the politicians will take your money against your will. So you either get to choose where you spend your money or you get told. So they decide to be proactive and choose with the hope of getting a, uh, a, a better deal than otherwise if they were treated equally, essentially. So they, they do still pay, it's just off, off the record, <laughs> essentially. Um, as, as far as lobbying goes, of course, it's a very shady area because it is just bribery, but it's a nice name for it. Um, sort of like lottery being legalized gambling and stock markets legalized gambling and <laughs> all that kind of thing just use a use a nicer word as of course the, the left have shown us that they are masterful at seeing as they care more about rhetoric than logic of course they've pretty much won the 
language war. Uh, one, one example of that is to say single parent household instead of broken home, for example, or politically correct in, instead of anal retentive, that kind of thing. I think really, really goes to show what, what they're getting at, and it's the same here. So, Labour Shadow Health Secretary Jonathan Ashworth welcomed the new target, but said it was not the 250,000 Boris Johnson promised. Mr Hancock said the government still hopes to get to 250,000, uh, with a, a population of, well, I suppose, <laughs> depending on which estimates you, you believe, it's, it's almost 100 million across the entirety of the UK, um, in which case, of course, you've got to test people who don't have it, in which case they're null and void because you have to test them again at a later point. The problem with these tests, of course, is that they aren't necessarily reliable. I'm not saying that they're as bad as the test given to Italy by China, which only had a reliability of 20%, um, but nonetheless they they wanted to be above that 95% so that the, the, the p-value is less than 0 0.05. And then when it comes to the antigen testing to see if you have already had it, then they want that to be much higher. Um, of course, at this point, level, nothing's going to be that reliable because there are always odd things that happen with humans and there are always some sort of genetic mutations which are going to show up, which weren't really accounted for because trying to account for them would just be far too expensive and it just is impractical. So you've, you've got to find a balance between the two. But if, if you get to a good enough point of which it hasn't happened by chance, which is why the, the p-value is there, but of course they want a smaller one, then it doesn't matter if the reading is wrong per se, because uh, again, you've got to herd immunity by then. But yes, they are aiming for 100,000, of course, and good on them, good bloody luck, and I love that, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Uh, it's like, yes, now, now that you're paying for something that you don't get to choose about, we're going to tell you how to um, make it work as well, because that's what taxes do, of course, then. Instead of you deciding what you want to spend your money on, you are forced to pay for things which you may or may not support, and are then told how to make that work for you the best. Uh, it's, it's no longer a like charitable donation or a, a willing exchange, in which case you decide to uh, give your patronage to whoever you think worthwhile, but you become a, a forced customer and client and almost an employee of that government initiative because then you have to abide by it as well on, on threat of imprisonment, uh, losing even more of your freedoms and in the worst instances, if you resist, then of course death, which the government will think nothing of it. So man fought back um, from us stealing his freedom and he wouldn't go quietly and he, uh, therefore we had to take him out because now he was a threat to the police. So well, why were you there in the first place? <laughs> oh, he, he didn't pay for murder. So, well, you, right, you're, you're a gangster. You're a mobster. You're, you're the mafia. Brilliant. But, yes, nonetheless, of course, they're going against what, what they've already said, basically, uh, of particularly the singling out Premier League footballers here to say, yes, hey, the government initiative has said, we'll, we'll pay your wages. And now they're saying, yeah, but these guys, they're earning a bit too much. So we're not going to pay them. So, well, <laughs> yes, when it comes to more government initiatives, then, of course, you decide what's fair and what isn't and what the the, the, the value of their, their labour and their work is or their results are, and you're not allowing the free market to decide, in which case you have such a brain drain, as we saw in the 70s, three-day work weeks, and how, how long it took the economy to recover there. And we're seeing a, a similar thing now, but, of course, more severe in the short term. So we're going to see a similar outcome. But if the government tries to step in there, of course, then that's that's going to be gone as well. It, I think, and, and this this is the the wider point that I, I think can attest to everybody that it comes down to a sense of gratitude. That no matter what situation you're in, there is always something to be grateful for. And I'm not saying you should be taken advantage of and walked over. No, of course not. You should take care of yourself first and foremost because it, it might be a revolutionary idea, but you can actually have the best for yourself, not to the detriment to others, but actually to the benefit of them. In which case, you should want the best for you and try and put the strongest version of yourself forward into the world. And therefore, you can be grateful for the other people, the interactions that you have, the things that you've had given unto you, the, the time at which you were born into, the country you were born into, the families, the friends, the, 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 the chances that you've met the people that you have and you've been able to strike up those friendships and that you've, you've been awarded these opportunities or receive this luck and you can be grateful for so many different things and it's impossible to be fearful and grateful at the same time or angry and grateful at the same time or upset and grateful at the same time 
if, if you focus on the gratitude, then it, it's going to work so much better as well, of course, because the the other people are, are aware that you know what's going on, so you're not going to be taken advantage of, but you, you are grateful for them putting in that effort where you, you see it, and therefore they feel compelled to provide more as well because they know that it isn't a lost cause because they are actually getting something for their input. So, hey, to everybody, be grateful, develop that sense of gratitude, meditate in the mornings to make that happen if you have to, and until next time, have a good one.